Okay, welcome to lecture 21C, which is electromagnetic waves. Describe the electro, we're going to be describing the electromagnetic wave, the spectrum, the speed of light and vacuum. We're going to calculate that from the permittivity constant and permittivity is free space, also from the magnitudes of electric and magnetic fields. We're going to talk about the intensity of electromagnetic waves and how to calculate that, and of course, the wavelength and frequency. Okay, now, Ampere's law was fine and good. Okay, you'd say, and it gives the magnetic field generated by a current that's enclosed, circled by a closed loop. Faraday's law gives the EMF or the electric field created by a changing magnetic field. And we know now that magnetism and electricity are linked. Before they, they thought they weren't. They thought they were independent of each other. But now we know that currents are produced by electric fields and themselves produce magnetic fields. Now symmetry is always a very powerful concept in physics. So it's natural to ask, can we close the loop? Can we literally? Can a changing electric field produce a magnetic field? Now, Maxwell realized that this was probably true, that there was something missing, and he completed the symmetry. And symmetry is always the holy grail in physics. Okay, so Ampere's law gives a magnetic field generated by a current enclosed by a closed loop, encircled by a closed loop. So if you apply Ampere's law to a charging capacitor, there's nothing that says you can't do that. We're going to take this, break this up into surfaces. Okay, here's our parallel plate capacitor. We assume it's an ideal capacitor. Or vacuum filled and then we have the wire coming in it carries a current as the capacitor is being charged there's an electric field between the plates that builds up as the capacitor is being charged we're going to take several surfaces we have a closed surface here surface one with a closed path around the wire that's carrying the current in to charge the capacitor we have another surface here sort of looks like this cylindrical surface here sort of like a lampshade this reminds me of a lampshade then we have a surface that's inside between the parallel plates parallel to them. Now remember, a parallel plate capacitor has a uniform electric field, but this is being charged, so the electric field is building up as time goes on. Now for surface one, there's no problem. There's a current in the wire that pierces the surface, and it will generate a measurable magnetic field around the wire. And we can do that by just putting a, you know, put a magnometer near there or, some, or, or you know, a, a compass needle will point in the direction of the magnetic field or, you know, sprinkle iron filings around it. Surface two is just as valid, but there's no current that goes through the surface itself. Remember, the current has to go through the surface for this to work. Yet, we can find a magnetic field here. We can detect a magnetic field around the capacitor, but only while the capacitor is charging or discharging. We can also take this surface here, this parallel to and between the plates. Again, we have a magnetic field, but there's no current. This is an electric field. There's no current here. It's just a field building up. In other words, a magnetic field exists as long as the electric field inside the capacitor is changing. But this doesn't count that, cover that. There's no time-changing thing in here to count for that. Maxwell fixed this. He fixed this by imagining something he called a displacement current. It was created by the changing electric field. And, of course, here it is. This is the displacement current. Here's the, permit, the epsilon naught. And here is the ch time change rate of flux change, electric flux change. So now we have Maxwell's idea. And he said that when you charge or discharge a parallel plate capacitor, Q is source always epsilon naught times the area of the plate times the electric field. And the charging rate is equal to the current, which is time rate of change of, of charge that before. And that will equal epsilon naught A times the times the change of the electric field with respect to time. We're going to assume an ideal capacitor has a uniform electric field, displacement current, Maxwell's displacement current is epsilon naught times the time change of electric flux. And of course, the flux is just E times A. So this becomes this, okay? And then finally, we can pull the electric field is the only thing that's changing here. The area of the capacitor is not changing. So we can say that ID is epsilon naught A times the time rate of change of the electric field. If you look at these two equations here, they're the same. If the equations are the same and the physics says it's okay, they're the same. So I equals ID. Or in other words, this current is the displacement current. It's the same current you're using to charge the capacitor. Okay, so this solves the mystery. All you have to do is add this term here. Here's the steady state condition right here. Here is what happens when you are charging or discharging the capacitor. Here's the, here's the time varying part of this. So when the capacitor is being charged and the electric field is changing, there is a magnetic field around the wires and also one that is around the capacitor and between the plates too. So a changing electric field creates a magnetic field. 
Furthermore, Maxwell realized that a changing electric field induces a changing magnetic field, which induces a changing electric field, which induces a changing magnetic field, so on and so forth. And we call this magic electromagnetic radiation. To a physicist, that's light. Any kind of light, any electromagnetic radiation is considered to be light. And you can see this is what happens here. Okay, as this thing, as the charge increases, it creates a magnetic field. It also increases. Okay, now, we want to create electromagnetic. It's fine to do this between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor, but what else can we do with this? Well, we want to create an electromagnetic wave. So we need a changing electric or magnetic field. It turns out the easiest way to do this is to create the changing electric field. So you build a radio transmitter. And here's a radio transmitter right here, this whole thing right in here. Okay, so what we do is we have an LC circuit. It's, it's really an LRC circuit, but the resistance is, we, kept the, we keep the resistance as low as possible because resistance just basically wastes energy. Okay, so we try to keep that as low as possible. So you connect an LC, LRC circuit to an antenna and the antenna is made of conductors. And we drive the circuit, which is called an oscillator, with it at its natural frequency, at resonance, with a power source. So what happens then is, of course, the driven LC oscillator will set up a changing electric field in the antenna. That will create electromagnetic waves that trans travel outward through space and time. This is a radio transmitter. Now, this transformer here is, is an impedance matching device. Remember I mentioned that to you in the previous part of this chapter? It basically matches the impedance of this to the load here, which is, of course, the transmission line and the antenna. The, this, caught, this changing electric field in here, changing electromagnetic field in here, makes the electrons in the antenna dance, okay? Literally switch back and forth, move back and forth. They accelerate. Every time they change direction, they're accelerating. And that acceleration creates a changing magnetic field, which induces a changing electric field, which induces a changing magnetic field, and creates the traveling electromagnetic wave. Now, that'd be well and fine, be fun to do, but you might want to use this as a communication device. So what you do then is you use another LCR circuit over here, and if you tune that to the same frequency, the same natural frequency as this, in other words, set out, set out a bit so it's at resonant that same frequency, connect it to an antenna, through a, so just this again, but over here, okay, it will detect, respond to and detect the electromagnetic waves that this one produced. And that is a radio trans, transmitter and a receiver. This is how your cell phones work. This is the cell tower. Here is the phone. So what have you got? You have a changing electric field that induces a changing magnetic field. A changing magnetic field induces a changing electric field. Together, these are perpendicular to each other, and they're also mutually perpendicular to the direction of travel. And this is called an electromagnetic wave. Now, what type of wave is this? You think back to physics 111, or physics 1. You talked about vibrations. And he talked about there were two basic types of waves. There is a transverse wave and there's a longitudinal wave. Now, sound waves are longitudinal. Electromagnetic waves are transverse. That means the vibration direction is perpendicular to the direction of travel. So this means that the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, and they're also perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is traveling. So the electric field is always perpendicular to the magnetic field, and these fields vary sinusoidally, just like transverse waves. They're sine waves. The fields also have the same frequency. So the electric field will have the same frequency as the magnetic field. And they are completely in phase with each other. Because remember, you generate them using an oscillator that's in phase, a resonance. So they're always in phase with each other. There's a right-hand rule for electromagnetic waves. Yet another right-hand rule. Index finger is the electric field. The electric field is what, if you have it in a wire, is what makes a current. So that's easy to remember. Index is the index finger. That's I for current. The middle finger is still the magnetic field. Middle for B, for B, magnetic field. The thumb now is the direction of the waves travel. Okay, now this thing is not a steady state. It's going to be flipping back and forth. So you're going to have to flip your hand back and forth at two times the frequency. I wouldn't suggest you do that. It's going to wear out your wrist. And what is the speed of the wave? The speed of the wave is E over B. Okay, where E is the electric field strength and B is the magnetic field strength, okay, the amplitudes. And that happens to equal one over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. So magnetic field, the magnetic field varies 
sinusoidally inducing via Faraday's law of induction, a perpendicular electric field that also varies sinusoidally at the same frequency. Because the electric field is varying sinusoidally and will induce via Maxwell's law of induction, a perpendicular magnetic field that also varies sinusoidally. The two fields continuously create each other via induction, and the resulting sinusoidal variations of the field travels away, and that's the electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves, waves are the only type of waves that can travel in a vacuum. Every other wave requires a medium. Sound waves require a medium. You can't hear, they can't hear you scream in space. They can see you scream in space, but they can't hear you scream in space. That's because sound waves require air or something or water or something to travel in. Electromagnetic waves travel better in vacuum than they do in anything else. And they're the only waves that do travel in vacuum. So the next time you step outside in the, in, and look, you know, feel the sunlight on your face and watch the, you know, look at, look at the beautiful sunlight. Think about that. There is a vacuum of space. There's 93 million miles of vacuum between the sun and the earth. And yet that sunlight comes to, comes across that vacuum of space and lands on your face. That's absolutely cool. Okay, now the speed of light is constant regardless of the frame of reference. Everybody, no matter how fast they're moving, measures the speed of light at a constant speed. This is the special theory of relativity, which we will cover in chapter 26. Now the meter is now defined, so the speed of light in vacuum is exact. So the speed of light is, is one of these physical constants that is actually very useful. If you want to know the speed of light out to nine digits, here it is. That's how, how, how much we know it now. A light is the fastest thing in the universe, but it is extremely slow when compared to the immense size of the universe. It takes a finite amount of time for light to travel. We just don't notice that because relative to us, it travels pretty fast. But in reality, it's really slow. If you look at something one meter away from you, do you realize you're seeing it as it, as it is in the past by 3.3 .3 nanoseconds? So if you look at something that's two meters away from you, it is 6.6 .6 nanoseconds in the past. And if you look at the sun, please don't look at the sun with your naked eyes. If you look at the sun, it takes eight and a half minutes to reach Earth, for that sunlight to reach Earth from the surface of the sun. And the most distant naked eye object that we can see, which is the Andromeda galaxy, it's, it's our sister galaxy in our local group. It takes 2.2 .2 to 2.5 million years for the light to reach us from that. And equally, if there are aliens in the Andromeda galaxy looking toward the Milky Way, it's going to take them, take that light 2.5, 2.2 .2 to 2.5 million years to reach them from our galaxy. If anybody needs, wants to find out how to find the naked, find the Andromeda galaxy, I'll be happy to show you. You do have to, you do need a dark sky location to do that. Okay, now I mentioned the electromagnetic spectrum. We call the range of wavelengths of light. And light, it does not just include visible light, it includes all the different types of electromagnetic radiation. We call that spectrum the electromagnetic spectrum. Light can have any wavelength or frequency. There's no upper or lower limit. And we have given names to various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, mainly for convenience. And remember, the speed of any wave is the product of the wavelength and the frequency. Now, the speed of light is C, so we can say the C equals F lambda. Notice that these are inversely proportional to each other. As the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases and vice versa. Okay, so here's a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'm gonna start down at the low end. The frequency at this end is very low, but the wavelength is very long. And you can see, you know, this is, it could be the size of the earth. Okay, it could be bigger, it could be the size of the solar system. There's no limit on any of this. Okay, the 60 Hertz wall, socket outlet, the current coming out of that, here it is right there. So this is very low frequency, very long wavelength, and very low energy per photon. Get into the radio waves in here. Okay, that would be like your AM radio, F, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, your FM band is up here. Notice that there's overlap here. These are just arbitrarily decided, and there's a little bit of argument where they begin and where they end. The microwaves are here, radar, your cell phones. TV, satellite TV, that kind of thing. And your um, Wi-Fi is in here. Then we get to infrared. Infrared is basically snakes can see in infrared. Infrared, uh, infrared cameras, the cameras that they use to catch thieves, you know, in the night. You can see night vision cameras are in the infrared band. 
Then we come to visible light. Visible light is the smallest part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and actually, it's overdrawn here. In reality, you couldn't even see it on this. It'd just be a little thin line. Visible light runs from about a frequency of about 4 times 10 to the 14th hertz up to a frequency of about 7 times 10 to the 14th hertz and about 700 nanometers to about 400 nanometers, give or take. Above this, of course, is ultraviolet. Ultraviolet can damage your skin and it can damage your eyes. As you go to the higher end here, higher energy end, the potential for damage increases because the energy per photon constantly increases. The wavelength decreases, the frequency increases, and the energy per photon also increases. As you get past ultraviolet, you get to x-rays. X-rays are what they use to take pictures of your teeth okay, when you go to the dentist. They will penetrate soft tissue, but they don't penetrate bone and hard tissue or metal, but they still can damage your tissues. When you get above the x-rays, you get up in the regime of gamma rays. Gamma rays can penetrate just about any part of your body and they can seriously damage your DNA and the gamma rays are what you worry about in the nuclear blast. Okay, that's what basically causes the cellular damage, the extreme cellular damage. You don't want to be around gamma rays. Okay, now visible light, which is the part that's important to humans, we're going to, we call Maxwell's rainbow. The center of, center of the visible region is about 550 nanometers and this produces the sensation that we call yellow-green. The limits of the visible spectrum are not very well defined because they actually sort of tail off here. They don't really disappear, but, so we have to decide. So we take li limits arbitrarily, and typically it's as a wavelength that which eye sensitivity is dropped to about 1% of its maximum value, and they're about 430 to 690. However, the eye can detect stronger. If you get out here and it's strong enough, you can still see it. Also, people have different visibilities. Okay, some people can see into the near infrared. Others can see into the near UV. So we usually round this, for convenience sake, to 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. But different animals, just like people are different, animals are different too. Cats and bees can see ultraviolet. Rattlesnakes can see infrared. They use infrared to hunt their warm-blooded prey at night. Okay, now the sun, its peak emission is about 500 nanometers, and that's green. So the sun is really a green star. To us, it just looks yellow because our atmosphere absorbs and scatters blue light. If you subtract blue light from green light, you wind up with yellow. In space, the sun will look white because to our eyes, and you blend the colors into white. All electromagnetic waves do one thing. Regardless of their wavelength, they transport energy. That's their job. And so we want to figure out how much energy they transport. Now, since it's a time varying thing, we're kind of interested in something that energy per time, that'll be the power. And since this, these things spread out as they travel from a source, we're interested in the power per unit area. And this is called the pointing vector. And it's given, it's given the symbol S and it, the vector points in the direction of the travel of the wave. So it points toward V, your thumb, remember when you use that? This will involve the cross product of the electric and magnetic fields, which is way beyond the scope of physics 122. But we have some advantages here. The electric and magnetic fields are always perpendicular to each other, and they're always in phase. So we can use that to calculate the instantaneous magnitude of the energy transport, and it'll be E times B over mu naught, or E squared over C mu naught, or C B squared over mu naught. Now, that's well and good, but usually because these things vary, and varying is a pain in the butt to deal with, and remember, we use the root mean square to get around that. Well, we're going to do that again. We can calculate the timed average rate per unit area at which energy is transported. And this is called the intensity of the wave. So we define it like that. The intensity of the wave is the RMS E, E RMS squared divided by C mu naught, or C B RMS squared divided by mu naught. And the units for that are watts per square meters, as you would probably guess. Now remember the RMS is the, e, the amplitude divided by the square root of 2. This, of course, is the quotes average. And root, it stands for root mean square. E max, of course, is the amplitude. Also remember that C equals E over B. That also equals the RMS value, divide, E RMS divided by B RMS. It'll equal the instantaneous E over B. It'll also equal the peak E over B. Okay, it doesn't matter. This, this equation works for everything. Mainly, why? Because they're always in phase with each other. Now, if you have a point source of electromagnetic rays, like say a star, that will emit the waves isotropically. 
It is with equal intensity in all directions. And it's sort of like gravity. It had cover, it follows an inverse square law because as you go away from the source, the intensity will drop off as the inverse square of the distance from the source. You can sort of picture like a large balloon that's being inflated and the rubber of the balloon gets stretched and stretched and stretched over an ever larger area that encloses the sphere of the balloon. So that ends up being P over A is the power of the source divided by four pi R squared. And notice it's an inverse square law, just like gravity. The energy density of electromagnetic wave, half of it's carrying the magnetic field, half it's carrying the electric field. So the total energy is the sum of both of these. The magnetic, the energy density of magnetic field is B squared over two mu naught. Remember it's one half times something squared times a constant. And in this case, the constant is one over mu naught. The electric energy density is one half times epsilon naught times the electric field squared. And you can see it's one half times something times something else squared. Now, each component has an energy that's equal to the other and carries exactly one half of the total energy of the wave. And you can see this by writing down for the various formulas. Here's the energy density for the electric field. Here's the same thing for the magnetic field. But we have a conversion factor, E equals CB. And we also know that C equals 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. If you plug this in here and do the algebra, you will see that UE equals UB. Okay, now when you look at the North Star, which is Polaris, you actually intercept your eyes, intercept light from the star. There's a distance of 431 light years. It's emitting energy at a rate of 2,200 2, times that of our sun. So this is a big star. It's actually one that's evolved and will eventually die. The power of the sun is 3.9 times 10 to 26 watts. We're going to neglect any atmospheric absorption. We're going to find the RMS value of the electric and magnetic fields when the starlight reaches you. Now, just as with any of these example problems, you should work on this at home, copy it down in your notes, and then see if you got it right, sort of as a self-assessment. Okay, the physics of this is an inverse square law, and we're talking about the intensity of light and power transmitted in an electromagnetic wave. First thing you do, you write down your knowns and unknowns. You're going to have to convert some of the units. And this is definitely going to strand out, going to convert that unit. You're going to have to figure out what the actual power is. So you're going to multiply these two. At this point, you also write down, this is what you're looking for. You have the four, you look up and find the formulas. Intensity, which we just gave, the RMS squared over C mu naught. It also equals the power of the source divided by four pi R squared. And we have this relationship, E over B equals C. At this point, we can start plugging in numbers. And I equals the RMS E squared over C mu naught or PS over four pi R squared, we can combine that. And we can say that ERMS e is the square root of P, that's the power of the source times the speed of light times mu naught, divided by four pi R squared. And BRMS is just ERMS over C. So it's gonna be the square root of the quantity, the power of the source, mu naught, divided by four pi R squared times C. Now we have to convert this power of the star into watts. And if you multiply the ratio between the star's power and the sun's by the power of the sun you'll get that turns out it's 8.58 times 10 to 29th watts we also need to convert the light year to meters there are 9.461 times 10 to 15th meters per light year you can see the light years are going to cancel out here and it winds up 4.08 times 10 to the 8th meters now at this point we're pretty well ready to start plugging numbers in and we're using this formula here's the power of the star converted to the power to watts here is the speed of light. Here is our old friend, mu naught. And we have 4 pi and, of course, the radius squared. It turns out the electric field strength is 1.2 millivolts per meter. We can also find the magnetic field strength. There's two different ways. You can either divide this one by C, or you can go back to first principles. So the RMS is going to be the square root of PS mu naught over 4 pi r squared C. Here is our power of the source. Here is mu naught. Here is the 4 pi. Here's the R, and of course, you've got to remember to square that. Here's the speed of light. So the RMS is, BRMS is 4.1 times 10 to the minus 12 Tesla. Okay, now light can exert pressure on, we don't think of that because the pressure is relatively small. It can also cause a, an object that it shines on to change momentum because it exerts a force, believe it or not. So we're going to flash back to physics for a second. Whenever you're doing work, the work will be the change in energy. And that, of course, would be the force through the distance. And of course, the good thing about this, it's always just the direction of the wave travel. So then the, the change of energy is going to be F delta T, that's momentum. 
and times the the, cha- the velocity. And remember, this is going to be c, the speed of light. And the change in momentum will be the change in energy divided by v. That's just turning this around. So we have delta u equals the momentum times the velocity. And the change in momentum, it's just delta u over c. That's just turning this around. So this Maxwell show that an object that is free to move will gain linear momentum as, as it absorbs radiation. And in this case, the direction of momentum change of the object is the direction of the incoming beam of radia- radiation that the object absorbs. Part of this depends upon the elasticity of the collision. In a perfectly elastic collision, the object will hit, the light beam will hit it and come back, reflect perfectly. And this means that the change in momentum is double that of a complete loss of momentum. So in other words, it's the difference between a perfectly inelastic or squishy collision, or it just sticks together afterward, and one that's perfectly bouncy. If we assume all the energy is reflected by the object, pressure becomes 2 delta U over C. Momentum change is 2 delta U over C. This always winds up between two values. One is perfectly absorbed, and that's just delta U over C. The other is perfectly reflected, and that's twice what the absorbed was. Now we're going to back up a little bit to the change in potential energy. We can write that as delta U equals F delta T times C, so momentum times velocity. The force exerted by the power of the radiated energy it's just delta U over C delta T. So it, it exerts a force too, light exerts a force. And that's just P over C. So the intensity is a function of powers is distributed over an area. So the intensity is power divided by area, or power equals I times area, where I is intensity and A is area. So that combining this, these two terms together, we can find the force for total absorption or total reflection. And anything in between is defined as, here's for absorbed, I over C, Here's for a reflected note, just like the previous slide, is two times what it was before. Okay, so there's that too. So reflected is twice as much. Now, if the energy is partially absorbed or partially reflected, it's going to be somewhere between these two extremes. Okay, now pressure is the distribution of force divided by area. So PR, PR is F over A. Then the pressure of total absorption, total reflection, anywhere in between. Here's what it is, 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 is if it is absorbed, it's the intensity divided by the speed of light. If it's reflected, it's just twice what, it, what the absorbed value is, so 2i over c. Okay, now we have an electromagnetic wave that's traveling west. The magnetic field is oscillating vertically and has a frequency of 80 kilohertz, an RMS strength of 9.75 times 10 to the minus 9th Tesla. What is the frequency and RMS strength of the field? The physics of this is electromagnetic waves. We write down the knowns, 80 kilohertz. Convert that to SI right off the bat. The magnetic field is 9.75 times 10 to the minus 9th Tesla, and we want to know the frequency and the RMS strength. The frequency, that's a trick question. They gave you the frequency of the electromagnetic wave. That's both components. They rise and fall together. We also know that C equals E divided by B. So E equals C times B. Now here is our C and here's our B. A units conversion, 2.93 volts per meter. Okay, now the checkpoints should also be done at home. And then when you view the lecture videos or if you come back to class, check them off. If you got a whole bunch of them right, you probably know this stuff. If you don't, you need to review. Okay, now before the days of cable, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and I was a child, televisions had two antennas on them. One was straight and the other circular. Which antenna could pick up, if either, could pick up the magnetic oscillations? Well, it turns out this is the circular one. Remember the conducting loop? And you dropped a magnet through it. Okay, and then when that happened, the conducting loop would develop a magnetic field of its own had to generate a, a flux inside of it, and if it's a conductor, it will generate an EMF and a current. We can detect that, and it can actually be used to help a TV receive a weak signal. Okay, consider the region of space that you're occupying. Which of the following types of electromagnetic waves are present around you? Well, everything in a typical room puts off electromagnetic waves in the, in the region of the infrared, but that's just the peak. In fact, everything puts off every bit of radiation in the room. So, all of the above is the correct answer here. For which of the following properties do visible light and ultraviolet waves have the same value? Speed. All have a speed equal to C in vacuum. In 1667, Galileo attempted to measure the speed of light by having two people hold covered lanterns on hills that are about 1.5 kilometers apart. That's a little less than a mile. One person would measure time. Then one of the people with a lantern would uncover it. 
The other person would then uncover his lantern when he saw the light from the first lantern. It would go back. So repeated attempts failed. To see why, we're going to determine the approximate time it takes light to travel the 1.5 kilometer distance. You take the 1,500 meters, you have to convert it to meters, and you divide by 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It turns out to be 5 microseconds. The average human reaction time is 0.2 seconds, which is much, much larger, so the data is lost in the reaction time. Now, a radio transmitter has a vertical antenna. Should a receiver's antenna be vertical or horizontal to re obtain the best reception? Now, remember what's going to go on here. The electrons are going to dance in the antenna, and they're going to want to dance with the same amplitude that they have outside the antenna, or at least a reasonable approximation thereof. You want the antenna oriented in the electric field direction, if you orient it the other way, this oscillation might be rather weak. And there it is. The amplitude of magnetic field component of electromagnetic wave 1 is B. The amplitude for wave 2 is 2B. How does the intensity of wave 2 compare to that of wave 1? It's going to be four times as much. Why? This is squared. In both of these, E and B are squared. And, of course, B R M S is just the amplitude divided by the square root of 2, but they cancel out. If you double the amplitude, you quadruple. The RMS value and quadruples the intensity. Okay, thank you very much. Please go on and make sure you've done your homework. Go on to the next lecture slide, which will be chapter 2A. And if you have any questions, my email door is always open, at least especially during class time and regular class time, regular scheduled class time and office hours. However, due to the fact that I may be answering other students' emails, it may take me some time to get back to you. Rest assured I will. I am on the other end. And it's just that I might, you might be in a queue, okay, a long line. Thank you very much.